Good evening. I'd like to thank you for coming out to our event this evening. You know, we've got to stop killing uh, the Silky Slim Productions and also the Department of History. Uh, we're going to try to start a racial justice uh, series. And we were, we were thankful that uh, Brother Silky allowed us to this venue and this historic date to bring to you uh, people who are in the struggle, in the battlefield uh, for racial justice. The irony is, just like with the police, sometimes we don't think we need them until we need them. But then you hear all the time people saying that Al Sharpton, Tony Crump, Jesse Jackson, why do we need them? They like the police. We don't need them until you need them. And then when you need them, you're going to be happy they were there for you and your family. Because when you understand the whole system of racial justice, racial injustice, and the struggle you have to try to do to get justice, it takes extreme force to go against those situations. So without further ado, we're going to behind. We're going to bring Brother Silky. He's going to introduce everybody and we're going to get started. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank y'all for coming in. And of course, you know, since I'm at Southern University, I definitely have to be on my best behavior. They may be promised that. So I definitely, I will definitely do that. But without further delay, we're going to bring the families up and the attorney crop and get this started because we were running behind. These individuals have come from out of town. Um, so we definitely want to get started so that we can get this underway. Thank y'all so much. here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and throughout the country. Uh, I, I, every time I talk to Silk, I get inspired because he tells me some real stories about this COVID. And y'all know Silk, so I'm not telling y'all nothing new. I see a lot of heads nodding. Uh, also, I have the great pleasure to be co-counsel with Carol Powell Lexon, a great lawyer here in Louisiana one of your own, and uh, she's just incredible to work with. She's a real um, champion in the courtroom, following the likes of Thurgood Marsha and Constant Motley and Wiley Brennan, all those others who fought for Brown versus Board of Education and the Selma Voting Rights Act, that is Carol Powell. <laughs> Then I will try to introduce everybody. Also, Mr. Marcus Coleman, who is a community leader uh, based out of Atlanta, Georgia, doing cases worldwide with Saving Ourselves. He started the National <coughs> Network in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, with Reverend Al Sharpton. And I'm so grateful to fight on the front line with Marcus, and you will hear from him as well. But the reason we're here, the reason we're here, we're here for our children. I got off the plane and flew from St. Louis with the Ferguson decision. And um, I remember I was sitting on that plane what it was about. It was about the Mike Browns, the Trayvon Martins, the Tamir Rices, Jordan Davis's, and the list goes on and on and on. But in those cases, it was explainable at least how they died, if not that it was justified how they died. But it was at least, at least explainable. It was at least logical. These cases, these three individual these three children, these sons, there is nothing logical. 
nothing explainable about how they died and how our government officials are trying to tell us how they died. You know, we're here in Louisiana to join the family of Dick Dwight III on the one year anniversary of his tragic killing. But before we get to Big White, I want to tell you about the people who came far and near to be in solidarity with Big White because they have their own story in their own state. First of all, we have Kendrick Johnson, and, and I'm letting them get into a lot more detail. I'm going to just give you the highlights of their tragic circumstances. Kendrick Johnson has I said when I first heard it, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, his mother and father sent him to school in Valdosta, Georgia with a book bag. The next day, he was returned home to them in a body bag. And the court explanation for his death was Kendrick climbed up into a rolled up wrestling mat in the high school gymnasium to get a tennis shoe. Got stuck, stopped breathing, and died. And told them to accept it and get over it. Well, Mr. Ken Johnson and Miss Jackie Johnson, his mother and father, refused to just get over it. They refused to stay silent. And from every from that day to this one, every day, they would go out and file off to Georgia at the Lowndes County Courthouse with signs saying, please help us find out who killed our son. Because it don't make no sense a person climbing up into a rolled up wrestling mat to get a tennis shoe. Or is it more likely than not that somebody killed him and rolled him up in that wrestling mat and put him in the high school gymnasium. And so they have been pushing Kendrick's law to challenge these coroner's conclusions of the manner and cause of death. Because it makes no sense at all, brothers and sisters. And they don't do this in any other community but our community where they tell us these ridiculous explanations for how they're killing our children. And if you thought that was bad, then we come to the matter of Chavis Carter. And his mother, Miss Teresa Carter, is here from Arkansas, Jonesboro, Arkansas. And Silky, they tell me, very similar to Victor White, that he was handcuffed in the back of a police car. They had checked him for weapons, patted him down. They were saying that he had a small amount of marijuana. That's debatable. Uh, but he was in the back of the police car. <coughs> and the police said, like Houdini, he some, they somehow missed the gun, and he somehow, hands behind his back, and it's even stupid to try to explain it as I'm standing before you. They say with his non-dominant hand, he was left-handed. They say with his right hand, he got a gun, somehow with handcuffed behind his back, and put the gun up to the right temple of his head, and fired the gun in a downward trajectory, the bullet coming out of his right ear, I mean his left ear, and then he puts his hand in the back behind his back, and they find him slumped over in the car. And they say to his mother, Teresa Carter, that your son committed suicide. He killed himself. And you just scratch your head and you say, you really expect her to believe this? And I know that you all know a little bit more than most in America about these Houdini handcuff killers because uh, as Attorney Powell is going to talk to you, Victor White III, mother, father, and sisters, and brothers are here. And Victor was in the back seat of the police car and he was at the police station. And he was handcuffed. 
for a very, he was arrested for very, very questionable circumstances. And they will be able to talk to you and link about that. And we'll be able to have a question and answer session. But they said, Victor, and within the back seat, handcuffed. And now they say, Victor got the gun and somehow figured out how to get the gun. It, it looked ridiculous what I'm doing. He somehow figured out with the handcuff, was able to, at first they said, Carol, and thank God, Attorney Powell was on the case, said he shot himself in the back. But Carol went to the funeral home and got photographs and was able to look at the injury wounds of the bullet and the trajectory markers. And they then had to change and say that the bullet came to the front of his chest, went in through the right side, even though he was left-handed. His non-dominant hands also shot him, Silky, and the bullet went through his lungs and came out on the left side. And then he put his hands back behind his back and handcuffed and was about slumped over in the vehicle. And they told Reverend White and his wife that your son committed suicide. And the only thing I can't understand, Silky and Marcus, and I, 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 I'm trying to watch my tongue and be respectful. But how in the heck is it that these little black and brown boys, because Jose Durante, he's not here from Durham, North Carolina, he allegedly did the same thing. So it's a phenomenon going across multi states, and that's why we're uh, starting to work with producers with HBO to talk about these Houdini handcuffed suicide killers because the question is, why do these little black and brown boys wait in until they're in the back of the police car to say we want to commit suicide? You know, or is it more logical to conclude that while they were handcuffed, somebody else shot them? Without further ado, I want to first bring uh, Mr. Marcus Coleman and Kendra Johnson's family up, and then uh, Marcus uh, uh, stay and help me talk about uh, Chavis part of this matter. And then Cynthia, we want to turn it over to Carol Powell Lentz and the Victor White family to talk to the people as much as they can, because this is emotion and pain. These are their children. And tell the story. And then Carol will come up and tell the incredible journey with the White family. And then we'll try to just have a community conversation. There's no question taboo. We really just want to tell you all why black life matters and why we got to stand up for our children, why we got to speak up for our children, and if need be, why we got to be willing to die for our children because they are children, and if we don't do something about it. Nobody else is going to do anything about it. So without further ado, I want to bring Mr. Uh, Ken Johnson and Jacqueline Johnson and uh, President Marcus Coleman of Saving Ourselves from Georgia. Just go down and then 
new manager stayed in that. My son played three sports. He ran track, he played football, and he played basketball. And if he was going to go over there, he was going to get a shoot. My son picked all the mats up and throw them down and went on to play. But I stand here today to let y'all know that I am Kendrick Johnson. I am Travis. I am Victor. I am their mother. And I stand with these families. Do better than that. Give it up for us. Just please, please repeat that to me. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Say it like you mean it. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. I hadn't been on this campus since 1995. I actually came out here from Atlanta, Georgia, and met my wife to this day right out here at Southern University. So y'all need to give it up for Southern University. <laughs> now listen, I just had to keep it real, because I am literally fresh off the road, Brother Pro. Yes, I could sir. not come here and not shout out to my wife. But this ain't no celebratory moment, right? I hadn't had the chance until just recently to meet the parents of Victor. I met the parents of uh, Chavis in Arkansas not too long ago. But here is the connection to these three families. Small town Louisiana, small town Arkansas, small town Georgia. Brother Crump, I know you just had a powerful meeting. So these words that I'm about to speak of of my own, okay? Shame on the Department of Justice. Shame on the Department of Justice. So one thing, in this brief time, y'all gonna get to know me. I don't always say what's popular, because I say what's right. How in the hell are you not going to, number one, charge an officer, right? When you lay out an investigation that lets you know that Ferguson Police Department is a cesspool of racists and criminals. If a cesspool of racists and criminals. If you took a fine comb through the police department of Ferguson, imagine what you would do, imagine what you would come up with if you took that same comb through the police department that killed Victor. I know, I know, I know, I know it's a little late, so some of y'all gotta get warmed up. I said imagine what you would come up with if you ran that same comb through the police department that killed Victor, or through the police department that killed Chavis, yeah. or through the police department or the sheriff's department that's responsible for Kendrick. Now, we can't say that Kendrick's death was by the hand of law enforcement, but I encourage you to Google the name Kendrick Johnson and you'll find that law enforcement is all intertwined when it comes to the cover-up. Shame on the Department of Justice. Yeah. You gave us the report, Brother Crump, yes, sir. and we appreciate that report. That report confirms what yourself, myself, and many others already knew. But shame on you for not, you've exposed them, not make an example out of them. <laughs> if you may, here's, a, here's an idea. You know, I, I'm not the U.S. Attorney General. Lord, y'all, a lot of people wouldn't want me to be, trust me. But here's, a, here's an example. If, if it's 88% is the lowest number that they found, from when it comes to the percentages that black folks are being targeted, right? 100% of those that are being attacked by canine dogs, right? Something like 86 or 7% of those for jaywalking charges. Something around 86, 87% of those that are arrested, are either pulled over, searched illegally. Then you might say, man, man, this brother from Atlanta, what's that got to do with Victor, Chavez, and Kendrick? If you make an example out of the Ferguson Police Department, it will set a precedent that you can't do this here in this country. I guarantee you this. To all my law students running around here getting your education, please get that up, because we need more of you. It used to be that, Brother Crump, we need faces that look 
like us in high places and then things will change. Well, the faces in high places are at least giving us reports. Now, we never had those kind of reports before. But I want you to think, this has always existed. The Attorney General before Holden knew this, the one before that knew this, and so on and so forth. So, if they knew this and didn't give us the report on it, which led to nowhere, what is the difference from the report that's been given to us and it leads, from, it leads to nowhere? Attorney General Holder, incoming Attorney General Ms. Lynch, even the President yourself. If we get on TV and we say that the children that have been slain resembles your family, I bet we would have some prosecutions if they actually were your family. So as I get ready to pass this mic, I'm just gonna talk real briefly about Kendrick. See, I don't like to sugarcoat nothing. You know, Brother Crump is bound legally by his profession in order to be PC at times. Hey, Silky, I just met you. I, I, don't, I, I don't have that, 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 that bondage. And look, that's not a diss, because this brother right here, if you got a te television anywhere, he get a lot of criticism, man. But you, hey, the criticism can just go on one end out the other, because this brother's all over the country fighting for our people. Let me get ready to pass this mic. Listen, man, this, you know, it, just, it just frustrated me, man, because I know you were sitting with the Attorney General. And listen, I've said this before, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I've had a chance to meet uh, 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 President Barack Obama. I had a chance to meet Attorney General Holder. I think they got very good spirits. I'm a reader of spirits. I think their spirit is good. But what good is a good spirit that sits in a wicked seat? Amen. Amen. Great. There's only so much they can do. Attorney General Holder just told y'all not too long ago the bar is set too high. Did anybody see that yep. interview? Yep. The bar is set too high in order for the federal government to come in and do something about it. So your cries fall on mute and deaf ears. If you got a black president and a black attorney general and a documented racist police department, but all you got is a piece of paper? What they tell you about the system? I see why there are anarchists in our country. I'm not claiming to be one, but I see why. And if you think anarchist is such a bad term, <laughs> I would tell you to look at the days and times right now you got even this even this thing we coined who handcuffed Houdini kiss suicide killer. I mean, where they do that at? Why? But y'all, you know, I get a little slang sometimes. Like, why would they do that, right? You know, some of y'all sometimes I get criticized. But listen, this is real. Why would we even have to come up with something of that title? It makes no damn sense. Telling this man's family that he shot himself through the back first and then they change it later saying he shot himself through the front. I mean, how in the hell do you get your hands around and shoot yourself point blank range? With Chavis, I, excuse me, with Chavis, I saw when they did the reenactment, Brother Crump. Yeah. They actually had an officer sitting in the back of the police car with his hands cuffed. But I actually spent a little time behind the walls and am the only person to this day behind the walls meaning in prison, in federal prison, 13 months in solitary confinement. To this day, I'm the only one that is the founder and former president for Reverend Al Sharpton with a criminal record because I know firsthand what injustice tastes, looks, and feels like. I say that to you because Brother Crump or anybody who's ever had those nice little silver bracelets put on their wrist, that reenactment had one strange thing to it, Silky. <coughs> the cuffs were as loose as can be, like sisters that have bangles on, right? I've seen bangles tighter than that. What a lie, and with that looseness of the cuffs, and that's the same thing, I don't know if they've done a reenactment on, 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 on you, Mr. White, 
But, but, but again, that reenactment with loose cuffs allows you to slide your wrist. Anybody that's ever had the bracelets put on, know they put them on to the point where it cut off your circulation. You ain't moving no wrist around. So, so, I just, you know, probably just pisses me off, because who do they think they fooling? Who, 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 who do you think you talking to? Who do you think you are? This ain't the 40s or the 30s. Them days is gone. That's why I applaud, I'm not a brother of the nation, Brother Crump, I'm not a brother of the nation, but I applaud Minister Louis Farrakhan for having the 20th anniversary of the Million Man March back in Washington, D.C. to march for justice on the Justice Department. On the Department of Justice. That brother's voice is re-emerging. Let me go, let me, let me get ready to go. But before I go, let me tell you one thing about Kendrick. Let me tell you one thing about Kendrick before I go. Because Brother Crump said that he crawled into that map and the cause of death was positional asphyxia. But that's not the only part of Kendrick. The parents exhumed Kendrick's remains in order to do a second autopsy, which took an act of con Congress, right? When they did the second autopsy, the second autopsy revealed Kendrick died of blunt force trauma, which honestly went hand in hand with the original EMT's report that initially found Kendrick. But that ain't, that ain't all of it. The autopsy didn't just reveal a conflict in the cause of death. Kendrick was missing every major organ in his body, his brain, his heart, his lungs, liver, gone. Tongue and windpipe removed as well. A hollow shell, only to be replaced with newspaper and magazine articles. But that ain't all of it. The clothes that Kendrick Johnson was wearing the day of his death have never been recovered. Lost, like his organs. But that ain't all of it. All 10 of Kendrick's nails were cut back to the point of bruising. Hmm? But yet they told this family he died of positional asphyxiation. Before I leave, and I'm gone, 30 seconds. I also represent a family that this case is international. They aren't standing with me right now. But it's the family of Boom Kong Pope Savan, AKA Baby Boo Boo. 19 month old toddler in Habersham County, Georgia, where no knock drug warrant with a raid was served on the wrong home. They bust the door open, tossed in a flashbang grenade. Two things were wrong. Number one, Brother Crump, they didn't deploy it correctly. Those things are not supposed to go airborne. Mm -hmm. So it never should have had the trajectory to even go into the playpen of the little sleeping baby boy. And it landed right by his face and blew his face open and blew his chest open. He survived. I heard a couple of people saying that uh, he was on, uh, in an induced coma and basically almost life support for a while. But that case has gone international. Why is that important? Because it's sitting in the hands of the U.S. Attorney out of the Northern District of Georgia. Kendrick Johnson's case is sitting in the hands of the U.S. Attorney out of the Middle District of Georgia. As we scream, Black Lives Matter, and Brother Crump, people kill me saying, well, you know, all lives matter. Yeah, we know that, but we're talking about the black ones right now because they seem to be the one that's got a problem when it comes to the investigation. So listen, I promise you, other families, I'm not trying to dominate time, but when you really are in this struggle, and when you really connect Mr. White to the family and to the struggle, you just can't come up here for five seconds unless you really photo op it. And I ain't photo op All power to the people. Thank you, Marcus. I, I told you, Silky. Yeah, I cut from the same cloth. Uh, Marcus, come back up. Uh, Teresa Carter, come up, if you would, uh, with your family. This is the mother of Chavis Carter from Jonesboro, Arkansas. Show her some love. Uh, Two white girls. Someone called the police and said they were sitting outside. 
police arrived. Chad is sitting in the back. They got him out the truck first, then the two white men. They patted him down. They searched him twice. Placed him in the police car. Ran his information. Took him back out the car. Searched him again. They let the two white boys go. Five minutes later, my son, he's dead. They say they missed the gun and he shot himself in the head. They searched him twice. No gun. Okay, they called me at 3 o'clock in the morning. Mind you that this happened like 9 o'clock that night. Said, oh, your son was in the traffic stop. Uh, we searched him twice. Uh, some kind of way he missed the gun and he shot himself in the head. Okay. So I go to the police station to see what's going on. Uh, they had already sent him out to get an alcohol without my consent. I didn't ID him or anything. Okay, I'm preparing for an arrangement. They gave me the runaround about picking his body up. I didn't get his body till like three days later. Okay, when we got him, his face was swollen and his whole arm was swollen. His bottom grew feel like somebody had jumped on him. My son was suicidal. He didn't kill himself. In the middle of all this going on, when the gunshot was fired, the dash cam just went off. That's amazing. It just went off. Of course, yeah. Yeah. The audio tape that the officer was wearing, it vanished. He said he lost it. Yeah. Done. And, and tell him, Teresa. He lost it from the scene back to the police station, which was one mile away. The audio that recorded everything just mysteriously vanished. I'm sorry. On top of all that, uh, when they got into the hospital, they ordered all personnel staff out the room. They was with him, I don't know how many hours. Uh, the gun. Of course, if he was the last one with, his, with it, he, if he killed, killed yep. himself, yep. it should have his fingerprints on it, right? Yep. How about there's no prints on the gun? None. And they tell me that he killed himself. How? He left hand. He was shot in the right too. Where the gun come from? Mind you that he wore his pants, as y'all call them, slouch, you know, baggy. You can see on the on the uh the little article they put on TV where the officer pulled his pants up twice. He wore a boxer, so if he had a gun, where was it? I mean, they expect me to believe that my son fits it. Twenty-one years old, he had his whole life to get him. For what? What reason? For a little dime bag of weed? So he won't shoot his death in the head. But if they put him in the car the first time, <clears throat> They pat him down, they check him. Why would he go through all the extra trouble to get put in handcuffs, then decide to go with Brian there? That don't make sense. Like me, he would try to say, the first round, right? My son didn't kill me. Marcus, if you want to call it that, and it's a silky and 
the professor said, we try to use these platforms to try to argue for black life. And a lot of people out there criticize us for arguing for Victor White, for arguing for Travis Carter, for arguing for Kendrick Johnson. And it's just the most unbelievable thing I can think of. And even some amongst us say, oh, you all are playing the race card. Well, what would you speak up for? You know, what would it take for you to say, I'm going to stand up, I don't care if they call me controversial, I don't care if they talk about me, I'm going to say that Victor White life matters, mm -hmm. that Chavez Carter life matters, that Kendrick Johnson life matters, Michael Brown life matters, Trayvon Martin life matters, 12 year old Tamir Rice in Cleveland life matters, Alicia Thomas in Los Angeles, her life matters. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And when we stand up and fight, would Carol Powell have the audacity to challenge the New Iberia Sheriff's Department and say the shot wasn't to the back, it was to the front? They said, oh, that Carol Powell, she ain't from around here. She's just trying to start trouble. Well, what would you start trouble for? If we ain't going to start it for our children. And like that, if I say it, our children are watching everything we do. You know, we say we care about them, but when we don't stand up for them, or we don't speak up for them, they say, do you really care? And so I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Y'all are the ones who get it. We just got to tell other people that if we don't speak up, it was Victor White for a doorstep a year ago. It was Chavis Carter's front doorstep three years ago. Kendrick Johnson's doorstep two years ago. We all speak up. It may be your doorstep. I think Sabrina Fulton got it right, Trayvon's mother, when she said, thank you for standing up for my child. Because he's not just my child, he's your child. He's all our child. And if it can happen to my son, it can happen to your son. Some people, Marcus, you know, and I'm successful, I make a lot of money out of this stuff. You know, that's bougie. Black people sometimes think that we are immune, mm -hmm. that it can't happen to our children. <coughs> Man, don't you know, when they see a black girl <coughs> in a gated community, they question what they're doing there. And you talking about, oh, that, that was somebody, they lived on that side of town. Well, it's happening on your side of town more than you know. I was talking to uh, a reporter with Time Magazine. I said, you know, I'm almost inclined to write a book saying a thousand black boys not named Trayvon. Because they, they act like this ain't happening every day in every city in America, in every state in America. Every day they end in white. They're killing some black child, and nobody is saying a word about it. And I just refuse to remain silent. I'm so happy that we got people like Silk and Marcus and Carol who will stand with these families despite what they say about them, how they try to attack them, how they try to attack their reputation, because I believe we serve a great God who sits high and looks low. And you know, when we step out to do right, he just takes it from there. And I'm, I'm giving all this build up because I, I, you know, this person here, she, Marcus, you know, I, I, I get to come and the cameras and everything be with me, and then I need to go home. Mm -hmm. And then they have to stay here and keep fighting on the front line. And I pray so hard for her every day. Thank you. Because I know <laughs> every time she goes to that courthouse and do that period, all eyes are on her. And she does it courageously and zealously, and she's a fighter. I'm so proud to call her my co-counsel. Uh, yeah, I'm going to bring attorney Carol Powell. That's enough for us to bring up get to White's parents. So please give her a big round of applause.
families that are on a mission for justice. They want justice for their children that have been unjustly killed in Georgia and Arkansas and here in Louisiana. Now, we are faced with a sheriff down in New Iberia, Louisiana, who apparently hasn't gotten the message yet. But it is our intent to make sure that he does get the message in spite of what the Justice Department has done or not done throughout the country. It is our job to take care of our children and it is our job to make sure that our lives do matter. Amen. All of our lives matter. And as the gentleman said earlier, we're talking about black lives and black lives are at the forefront because guess what? This is nothing new. It's just been Mr. Brown had to lose his life in order for the covers to be snatched off police brutality throughout the country. Mm -hmm. So right now, we have all these cases going on, and I'm gonna let Mr. White come up and tell you because on Friday, this past Friday, February 27th, Attorney Crump and myself, we filed our lawsuit against the New Iberia Sheriff's Department, and Monday, we file our lawsuit against these coroners that are going around doing these votes. We have absolutely no intention to rest until justice has been served, until these families receive justice and at least got a decent, logical answer for the death of their children. any type of fraud or any type of anything upon us. We are here to fight. We're on a mission. Attorney Crump, the family, and the supporters, we're here, and we're going to make sure that justice is served. I'm going to bring Mr. White up so he can talk about Victor White III. You heard um, Attorney Crump speak earlier about the uh, facts, pretty much, of what happened to Victor White III, but I want you to hear it from the heart of someone that this life has touched in a deep way the loss of his son, Victor White III, and this is Mr. Victor White Sr. Uh, let me say thank you to you all first. Again, I thank you for our attorney, uh, Lexi, uh, for continuing to fight with us and for us on behalf of my son because he can't tell his story. That's why we here, yes. to tell his story. See, the officers that gave us their version, they give us their version, but my son can't tell what happened. But a year ago, on a Sunday, March the 7th, about 11.40 at night, myself and my wife were in bed and received a phone call from my son from not being able to be down, saying that Victor White III and his friend were uh, stopped saying that uh, they were involved in a fight and they arrested him according to the friend. So I called the Beer Parish Sheriff's Department to see if they had my son in custody. They told me they didn't have him in custody. So then I called the Beer Parish Detention Center and they told me the same thing. So I even asked them, I said, okay, what is it involved? Because normally that's what I might go after if it is involved at all. I'm consulting with the Sheriff's Department. And so the next thing, so the next thing that happened, well, I told my wife, I said, well, they probably let him go. You know, so they don't need to worry. They said, they don't have me cussing, so they probably let him go. Well, 540, Monday morning, March the 3rd, same son called. He said, Daddy, uh, a sheriff detective just left here questioning me. And he said, and we call him on Sunday to watch the third, we call him the big. He said, say the big is big. So it gave me a number. I called up here at Sheriff's Department. They transferred me to the Louisiana State uh, Troopers Criminal Investigation Division. And it took about 20 minutes before anybody answered. We were on the back and forth from there. They sent them back to our very past Sheriff's Department. And then finally, Katie Morrell, they did call. And they told me that I needed to come to New Iberia. She told me I needed to hurry up and come. But she said, be careful. And she did say that my son was dead. And I asked, okay, how did my son die? She told me they couldn't tell me because it was an investigation. 
So I'm well from Alexander, so it's about two hours. So it's about two hours drive, we'll get down to uh, New Iberia. So I called them again and asked them, you know, Katie Morrell, okay, well, where is my son? I, uh, uh, I, uh, I mean, I want to see my son. She told me at that point that my son was being transferred, his body was being transported to the last dead forensic lab for an autopsy. I said, oh, no, ma'am, I need to see how do y'all know that's my son? She told me that uh, based uh, from his uh, ID, you know, they identified him from his ID. I said, no, I want to see my son. So she told me that uh, she had to get back with me. So I said, okay, well, where is my son? Buddy? They told me my son was seen at that beer pad, that beer medical son. So I drove to that beer medical son. And while at the beer, that beer medical son, I asked him about my son. They told me they couldn't tell me anything. They called in the visit, they worked on my son, and they said he couldn't tell me anything. So then they called the supposed medical records, the individual of the hospital, and they told me they couldn't say anything because it was about the investigation. And then they said I was listed up the next kid, so I wanted to find out information. And they told me they couldn't tell me any information. So then Ms. Katie Morrell did call me back and told me that they were willing to allow me to see my son back. But the stipulation was only one person can go back there. She said, and then further from that point, you can only see him from the neck up. Only see him from the neck up. And so then the coroner came and investigated whether the uh, Lieutenant Trahan, which he said he was a supervisor, was Katie Morrell. So we go back to the morgue. That's my son. Brother. And the first thing I know is he's been walking back. They told me I couldn't touch his body. But walking back there, I could see the left side of my son's face. First thing that stood out, I could see from the top of his left eyebrow, all the way down below his jawbone. I seen the mark. I seen how swollen it was, and the mark was just invisible. And not only that, in the center of his forehead, there you can see the swell. His lips were swollen. His left eye, his left eye was turned inward, not inward. She so I could ask him, I looked at him and asked him, what happened to him? My son, how did my son die? The investigator told me I need to talk to the state police. The state police said I needed to talk to the coroner, the investigator. And both of them looked at each other and said, at that point, they couldn't tell me anything because it was under investigation. So one of them even asked me, said, how did how was my son transported to the hospital? We took a trial and looked at the other end of it and said, oh, there's no need to ask that question. That's very important. No need to ask that. And I wanted to know how. And they told me that it was are still under investigation. So we left the hospital and we drove back to Alexandria, and then I got a call from New Iberia, Louisiana. A friend of mine told me to go look on the Louisiana State uh, Trooper's website. He said that the press release regarding the death of my son. And then when I did that, that was, they said that my son was involved in a fight on a store on Lewis Street, and uh, when they pulled him over, said they, they arrested him for a small amount of narcotics, and then when they took him down to the book that he uh, became uncooperative and while in the car, backseat, handcuffed, they say he produced a small uh, caliber handgun and fired one round, striking himself in the back, killing himself. And they say it was suicide. And from that point, I called the state troopers and told them, you know, uh, uh, I'm still just as angry now as then, but I thank God for grace. So I, 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 I truly thank God for grace in my children. I tell you, this is about the calm as I can be. Uh, this is but I thank God for change. I thank God for grace. And so while on the phone, I was talking to them and asked me that I want to talk to the uh, uh, supervisor. What do I need to talk to the supervisor for? I was just there. Why didn't y'all tell me before y'all listed it, put it out there? It's all on the world wide web. How my son, y'all said my son committed suicide, but no one could have, y'all didn't tell me before y'all even released it. And he said, well, it wasn't up to him, it was up to the supervisors. And then I still told myself, well, you know, that's kind of strange, you know, that my son would kill himself. Well, again, from that point, it took five and a half months. Five and a half months. And then they said the autopsy report was completed. And then we go to meet with Carl Ditch, the idea of Paris Corner. And this is like I said, he was shot in the back. Me and my wife were sitting there listening to him, and I could look in his face. Uh, 
as Mr. Morgan said, uh, the son of spirit. And I was the son of the spirit. And I could see he was trembling and shaking. And so I told my wife, this is not going to be a good experience. But I'm going to sit here. And we sit there, and as he was talking, saying that, and he said, well, uh, the man that called the death is suicide. And he said, because he said that my son was shot in the right side of the chest. And I said, say that again? And he said, I said, well, no, you said the initial report said my son was shot in the back. And he told me, no, it wasn't. The initial report, I said, yes, sir. The initial report said, he said, no, my son was shot in the right side. And so that's when I, I told him, I said, well, my son is left-handed. My son is left-handed. So you're trying to tell me he was handcuffed behind his back. And then he came and he shot himself in the front and the chest. And he said, yes, and he proceeded to talk. I told my wife, that's enough of this. We don't need to hear any more. We contacted our attorney, Carol Paul Dixon, because again, you know, the certain things go through, because uh, that's my son. That's my baby boy. You know, that's my namesake. That was continued, the line of whites. And it's been taken away. You know, and then they want me to be convinced that my son committed suicide. When I spoke to him Sunday morning, he was getting an apartment, had the money to get the car, and so therefore, why would he now kill himself? Why would he take his own life? He had registered, did the fast, but ready to go to college, shows out all these things. Why would he kill himself? Yeah. And so they continue to want us to believe that. I stand to say, my son did not commit suicide. Thank you. try to stay where we are with what we're doing. And let me tell you this, everything that you're seeing that's happening in the criminal justice system today is just exposing exactly what the criminal justice system is. It's a justice system being ran by a bunch of damn criminals. And you can't be afraid to say that when you see what's going on. When you have a prosecutor that say, oh, I, I, I had feelings that she was lying, and you still put her on the stand. Damn it, why you didn't let my homeboy get on the stand and testify and lie to me when I was on the stand? And you see these type of things taking place, and you see uh, injustice continue to be raised in America, we can't get past exactly what it is. We have to call it for what it is. We still have Jim and Jane Crow at the front and back down door, and we have to look at it for what it is. And if you're too scared to face that, then you don't need to be in this damn struggle. This is a real struggle that's going on. How do they expect for us to believe that our kids are removing handcuffs, killing themselves, and then putting themselves back into the handcuffs? And like Mr. Marcus said, I done had those damn silver blazes on my hand. And they put them so tight until when they take them off, it take a whole day for your hand to wake back up. The saddest thing is, is that we have put trust in the criminal justice system, and then we run to the justice system and say, well, look, they're not doing the right thing down in Ferguson. They're not doing the right thing out in Iberia. They're not doing the right thing all across America when we look at it. And we have to hold them accountable and continue to stand up and let them know that we're serious about our opinion. Now, I love that when we always say black lives matter. But let me tell you this too. Black lives have to start mattering to black people. And then we're going to be able to get back and watch the If I come out there right now and I walk on your feet, your feet ain't going to say that hurt. Your mouth will, why? Because it's connected to a nervous system. We got to get our nervous system back so when one black hurts, all of us hurt, and we'll let them know that we're going to die That's what we believe in. And so we do that, then we're wasting our time. So we have to show that love all across our nation towards each other because we are a people. Everybody else look at themselves as people, but when we do it, they call us being racist. We're not being racist, we're being real, damn it. We're tired of our children dying, and it's time for us to stand up and I'm going to die before I let mine die. I don't want to speak at the hand of anybody that wears a bag. We can't be afraid to get some members of the clan that has been authorized to wear badges and are taking out their agenda. We can't be afraid to say that because we already know. The sad part about this, we have to be real about this, is that this isn't new at all. It's just news again. Thank y'all.
Okay, so uh, I want to say uh, Marcus, Sylvia, we got cameras and stuff, but those boys don't listen to me. That's the truth. Uh, you know, in, in all seriousness, though, you know, we, we have, uh, we here in Louisiana, we have a lot of people say, you know, hands up for Mike Brown, I am Trayvon. We got to make sure when it's in our backyard, we got to stand up, you know? And I keep saying the same thing, Arkansas, Georgia, Tamir Rice, 12 year old in Cleveland. It's going to be a big case, and everybody's going to be saying justice for Tamir. Y'all, this happened way before Tamir Rice happened. We got to show, if we believe it, that all life matters, so we got to start. In Louisiana, at Southern University, we got to start a crusade for justice for Victor White III. Before you go to And, and my co-counsel, she gave me an all kind of case. She telling me, we got the 14 year old at home. And right, so, wrong before Tamir Wright. Wrong before yeah. Tamir Wright. Yeah. It's like I said, so many black children. You know, like I told the Time Magazine person, and I just saw, look on USA Today, Marcus, they got an op-ed piece where I talked to the reporter for 45 minutes today after Ferguson. And when Marcus talked about that high bar, I said, well, if the law isn't serving justice, then we got to fix the law to serve justice. Right. 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 You know, Martin Luther King said that law and order exists for us to achieve justice. But when it fails in that purpose, then it becomes dangerous dams that provide a blockage for moral men and good-hearted men that seek justice to be denied. And think about it when you talk about grand juries. It was supposed to be something to help us get justice. But what we saw in Michael Brown and Ferguson, Eric Gardner and Staten Island, and so many others, the grand jury system is denying us justice. So we got to change the law. And the only way the law changes is just like uh, Booker T. Washington said, power concedes nothing but to demand. We got to demand justice. You all know Eric Holder talked about this high bar. Because you really got to know this now. We talked about this high bar, Marcus, as you said, that we got to show an explicit racism. We got to say, when they kill our children, we got to prove their state of mind. How can you prove somebody's state of mind? That's when out you, of their mind. When you think about Ferguson, think about what Marcus and Sylvia was saying. They said that it was widespread discrimination and excessive force against African Americans. So why can't we use implicit bias, implicit racism? Because that means we can just take all the objective circumstances and come to a logical conclusion versus this impossible conclusion that requires us to be God, to say, I can say when the police officer shot Michael Brown, he was thinking racist thoughts. How can you prove that? Versus we know that this police officer, everybody he stopped was an African American. Everybody on the police force, when they let dogs on, was African American. 95% of the people who they gave tickets to we're African American. So at what point can we say, for all attendant circumstances, it sounds like a duck, it quack like a duck, it walk like a duck, it's a duck! Yeah. At what point can we get there, Marcus? It's a duck. So, Carol, you, you use these platforms, and hopefully, as we said at Dillard University, Mr. White, to say, we got to get the people not just screaming justice for somebody a thousand miles away from them, but they got to scream justice yeah. right here at home to their neighbors. And, you know, 
uh, we use these platforms and I pray as we get the crowds keep getting bigger that we can get uh, these major media markets uh, like HBO and stuff to highlight these matters. Because when people sit and say, oh, I never knew. You know, I didn't know it was like that. I didn't know it was that bad. So we got to shine the spotlight on these injustices. And that's why I thank these families for having the courage. And my heart was just breaking as Teresa Carter and Jackie. Johnson was talking about their babies. I mean, but I, I think that I have the courage to come and tell the story because if you don't shine the spotlight, nobody will hear it. And God knows these soldiers like Silky and Marcus Coleman. Again, great lawyers. I'm president of the national president elect of the National Bar Association. You have all these great lawyers, these unheralded lawyers. I get a lot of attention, but I tell everybody, you know, we all in this together. I can't do what I do without Carol Powell. I can't do what I do without every lawyer in every community I work with. We all together. And we got to keep pushing each other and building each other up. So every chance I get to brag on this sister, guess what? I'm telling the world she's a bad sister. Right. Educators and at this fine, this great institution, we now are here to the job and to the young people. The young people. I have a job sitting for me. I have to take a few questions and then let these people who drove thousands of miles to be here Kendra Johnson, Jackie Johnson, Teresa Carter, and family they came all the way here driving. On their dime, just to let Victor White and them know they are not alone. So, I guess. <laughs> so, I'll let you uh, take a couple of questions and then we'll hope to feed these folks. Right. God bless y'all. We all still on TV. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. They matter. First of all, before we start taking questions, I want to acknowledge somebody, Ms. Blair, right here. She's a frontline runner in Baton Rouge. She will be on the line. Just because she's a female, don't mean that she don't go through hell just like us. So believe me, I see her struggle, and I definitely respect her movement. All right, anybody have any questions for the family? We definitely will take them at this time. Yes, ma'am.